we speak part two of a series entitled Top Priority. And this morning we speak of hope. You know, uh, there is such a thing called garbology. <laughs> I'm not sure if you've ever heard of this term, but it is a sector of study that they call garbology. And there are garbologists. And one of the most popular garbologists is a man by the name of William Rafji, who uh, spends his entire life studying trash. He's a Harvard-educated researcher who believes that we can learn a lot from the trash dumps of the world. And so him and other archaeologists and garbologists travel the continent and they basically excavate landfills and document societies, eating habits and dress styles and economic levels. At the end of the day, what these men and women do is Rathji is able to find meaning in our garbage. Let's face it, there are seasons and moments in our life where we feel like somebody just backed up a garbage truck and dumped it into our lives. You must be wondering what all this garbage is in front of me. Sometimes life feels like we're in the midst of a garbage dump. I know that as I survey my life, there have been moments where I thought, Lord, how can I overcome this? And why are these circumstances and situations Coming into my life, I remember as a young boy living and being born in Laval, Quebec, and I was there, and I, and I loved being there, and I had all my cousins and relatives and friends, and I loved my school, and I loved my church, and then one day my dad, who was a pastor, says to us, you know, I'm feeling the Lord is asking us to move to Vancouver, B.C., where there's this small group of 10 people who want a pastor, who desire a pastor. And I feel like the Lord's leading us to plant a church. And I thought to myself, Dad, what are you talking about? Do you not see that I've got my own little neat and tidy world here? And so we embark on the journey and we go to Vancouver. And I hated every moment of it. No cousins, no friends, no routine, no school that I liked, no community that I liked. We lived in an attic of a church. I was surviving over somebody else's hand-me-downs. The church couldn't afford providing for us. And so in the evenings, all of us kids with mom and dad went off to cleaning offices. And in the wee hours of the night... And I hated every moment of it. And you know what my job was? Take all the trash bins and put it in the garbage bag. And as I was doing that night after night, knowing the next morning would come and I'd have to go to that school that I didn't like, <laughs> that school where I didn't have any friends and dumped in the garbage. And I felt like if this is what life's about, this is trashy. <laughs> And as I grew older, there were other things in life that made me feel like I was in a landfill. There was moments where my three grandparents, who I dearly loved, a small, close-knit family, who I saw right before my eyes deteriorate because of this horrible disease we call cancer. And I remember feeling as a teenager, thinking, how God can this happen to my grandma and my grandpa? And seeing them deteriorate right before my eyes. And I felt like I was in a garbage dump. And as I grew older, my brother, who has two boys, had a younger boy. And everything was great. And we were pumped. And we were excited. And then the test results started to come in. And we started to realize that Daniel had a lot of complications. And that's part of the reason why... Three weeks ago, I, my wife and I named our son Caleb Daniel. Daniel, a representative of my nephew, who was born with a rare chromosome condition. And, and as he's growing up, there's been all kinds of surgeries and all kinds of issues and challenges. And now that he's a teenager, he's this 
large in stature, young teenager, all with the mind of a grade five. And we're seeing all the complications and the difficulties that this will bring into our family as the years go. And there's been moments in our family where we're thinking, boy, why did this happen? I feel like we're surrounded in trash. Now, as a pastor, 15 years of full-time ministry has caused me to enter some very dark moments in people's lives. Being called into situations that just are horrifying. Being called into situations where there's been sexual abuse and there's private detectives and cops rushing in and people getting handcuffed and screams in the house and somehow you're there as a pastor and you're trying to bring some peace in the midst of the chaos. And you walk away feeling, boy God, this place is toxic. Or other times when you're called in and having to stand by the bedside of a 27-year-old and the doctors say it's over. And mom and dad and sister are there and they're trying to make sense of the situation. And there you are as their pastor trying to console and pray the truth. And basically, friend, I'm not going to lie to you, but that are horrible situations where you feel like you're surrounded with traffic. So this morning... I want us to look at the voice of Jesus and the words of Jesus. The question isn't so much, can we avoid the trash? Can we avoid the garbage moments? We realize you can't, because life always throws its curveballs at us, doesn't it? The question becomes, how will we respond in the moments of garbage? And Jesus lets us in on a secret. And he says to us in Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 to 23, listen to these words, friend. He says, your eyes are windows into your body. If you open your eyes wide in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. So if you've got your eyes wide open, no matter what life brings its way, with wonder and belief and trust in God, your life will be filled with light. However, if you live squinty-eyed, in greed and distrust, your body is a dank cellar. If you pull the blinds on your windows, what a dark life you will have. You see, we also have the choice in the midst of the garbage moments of our lives to get squinty-eyed and become, become resentful and bitterness and hatred and filled with hatred and anger and, and next thing you know everything we see is dark and we're like a dank cellar. And so in other words, Jesus is saying to us how we look at life. Whether the good moments or the very challenging moments, how we look at life determines how we live life. You can either choose to live life with eyes wide open in wonder and belief in God, or you can choose to get those eyes squinty and grow bitter and angry and hate-filled and you've got fists up to God, and soon enough you will become like a dank seller. How we look at life determines how we live life. And I want us to look into the five most darkest moments in human history, the life of Jesus. You see, Jesus experienced moments of trash. And the trash wasn't because of his actions. The trash that came into his life was because of our actions. And it was like a heap load of all the trash and garbage of the world that backed in and fell onto him and buried him. He knows what it's like to live in darkness and in trash. Let's look in on the five minutes of the darkest in human history. You see, the garbologist finds treasure in trash. Jesus did the same. What everyone else perceived as calamity, he saw as an opportunity. And because he saw what others didn't, he found what others missed. Let's look in. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's about to be betrayed and led to his death. Jesus experienced in the darkest moments of his life, unanswered prayer. Did 
you ever experienced that in your life? Where you sought the face of God and you've asked Him for certain things and out of desperation and silence. Jesus knows what that's like. You see, in Matthew 26, 37, it says He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, or Zebedee along. And he wanted his friends by Him in the darkest moments of His life. And so He took them with Him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. This wasn't just a bad day. He was feeling sorrowful and he was feeling troubled. In fact, Matthew 6, 39 says, going a little further, he fell on his face to the ground and he prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. He was in a state of desperation and he cries out to the father, Father, if there's any way this can change, may you do it. Have you felt that? Have you had moments in your life where you've been utterly knocked out and filled? Your life feels like it's a garbage dump, and you're like, God! Jesus knows what it's like. In fact, just to increase the intensity, Luke 22, 44 says, And being in anguish, Jesus prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. He was grieving, friend. He was in a dark place and he asked the Father, if there's any way you can take this cup of suffering, may you do so. But in his moment of agony, he hears nothing. In fact, Max Lucado says, never has earth offered such an urgent request. Never has heaven offered more deafening silence. The prayer of Jesus was unanswered. You see, though the entire episode couldn't have totaled more than five minutes, the event had enough badness to fill a thousand dumpsters. Except for Christ, not one person did one good thing. Search the scene for an ounce of courage or a speck of character and you won't find it. What you'll find is compost heap of deceit and betrayal. Yet in it all, Jesus saw reason to hope. And so he's there in the darkest anguish moment. And he's not hearing from the Lord. And then it gets worse. Jesus and his seeming unsuccessful ministry. It seems as though Jesus isn't experiencing much fruitfulness to all that he had done. We read in, in Matthew 26, 47, he says this, while he was still speaking to the disciples, a man by the name of Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And many times we focus on Judas, rightfully so. But listen to what the scripture says next. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the temple. The very people Jesus came to save have now come to arrest him. A very large crowd came with Judas. Many times we have this misconception that in that garden of Gethsemane, in the midst of Jesus' betrayal, it was just Judas and a few of his buddies. No, no, it was Judas and a large crowd. In fact, in John's account of the gospel, he says it was a group of soldiers. And he uses the word spiro, a Greek word, which indicates a section of army between 200 to 1900 soldiers. That means with Judas came at the low end 200 to the high end 1900 soldiers showed up in the Garden of Gethsemane. With bats and weapons ready to go. What makes this so dark is that after all that Jesus had done, after he had risen people from the dead, after he had healed and restored people, after he had delivered, delivered people of demonic oppression and possession, after he had saved people, forgiven people, after he had fed thousands of people out of a few loaves and a few fish, out of all those things, you think out of this large group of people, one person would stand up and say, hold up. We're making a huge mistake. We're defeating an innocent man. 
We're treating him like a criminal. He's the son of God. You'd think that even one out of this large group would stand up for Jesus. No. Not even one. Not even one stood up in character and said, wait a minute. This is what Jesus has done for me. This is what Jesus did for my family. This is what Jesus, I heard, did for this other family. Wait. Nothing. And so this dark five minutes came even darker. It became even more filled with trash because it seems like his ministry, after all those years, were unsuccessful. There he was. Nobody standing up for him. And then it gets even darker. You think there's enough trash now in the garden, but there's more to come. You see, Jesus and his incredible betrayal by his disciples. You see, because some might say, well, that was the crowd. They didn't intimately know Jesus. Fine, I'll give you that. But what about the disciples? They were his greatest friends. They were the ones who had front row seats to all that Jesus had done. Not only for them, but for those around them. But the scriptures tell us in Matthew 26, 56, that after all this episode in the garden, then all the disciples deserted Jesus and fled. It says all, every single one of them, not one friend, not one family member, they all deserted him in his most darkest moment of his life. Every single one of them. John, Matthew, Simon, Thomas. The list goes on. They all deserted it. What makes this so dark is that just 21 verses earlier in that same chapter, the scriptures say this. Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, Jesus, I will never disown you. And then the scriptures say, and all the other disciples said the same. 21 verses earlier, they had all claimed loyalty to him, that no matter what, even to the point of death, they would never abandon him or never leave him. And then, as much as they all claimed loyalty to him, they all disowned him. Talk about trash. Talk about garbage. Talk about darkness. From a human point of view, Jesus' world has completely collapsed. No answer from heaven, no help from the people, and no loyalty from his friends. It doesn't get more bleak than that. We too, I'm sure, carry with us unanswered prayers. Unanswered dreams that have never become a reality. I'm sure all of us have experienced betrayal. And have been handed heaps of garbage bags on the front porch of our homes. And on the front porches of our lives. The question becomes, what are we going to do with the trash? I think we do a couple things sometimes when trash happens. We tend to hide it. We tend to grab the garbage bags and fit in our jackets so nobody sees. Nobody must see. I need to pretend I've got it all together. We try to build churches with all perfect people with plastic smiles. The reality is there isn't such a thing. See, we all have garbage. And it accumulates every day, especially at our house these days. <laughs> But in a life sense, we all go through moments of life where the garbage seems to accumulate quite rapidly. And we try to hide it. And we try to pretend. You know what, friend? You're not fooling anybody. Because over time, trash starts to smell. And it begins to leak out of our lives. And hurting people hurt people. Sometimes we try to disguise our trash. So we paint them green and we put it on our lawn and say, hey, look at our tree. <laughs> we get really creative of how to 
disguise the stuff in our life and we come up with these nice pat answers and reality they're just eating away at us. And the smell is oozing out. See, Jesus somehow was able to see good in the back. The purpose and the pain and God's presence in the problem. Jesus was able to see good in the back. The purpose and the pain and God's presence in his problem. Let's look in and see what Jesus does in these dark moments of his life. Let's see what Jesus sees. And the first thing I noted was that Jesus found good and bad. It was hard to find someone worse than Judas, friend. I mean, Judas was a bad guy. He was a dark guy. I mean, he's responsible for the treasury. And people have given of the Lord's tithe and, and their offerings and to advance the kingdom of God. And Judas begins to help himself. Puts it in his pocket. It doesn't get any worse than that. He's a thief. He's filled with greed. He doesn't care. And then ultimately, he sells the Son of God for 30 silver coins. Which was a month's wage. Any human being is worth, in a month, worth more than a month's wage. In particular, the Son of the living God. He's a pretty dark guy. If you ask me, I don't see any good in that. I don't see any good in this man. And then to top it all off with 30 silver coins, he walks in with his hooligans and he says, Rabbi! And he kisses him on the cheek. Doesn't get any darker than that. But what amazes me is what Jesus says next. As Judas' face is inches away from Jesus' cheek, and Jesus knows what is about to happen, Jesus calls him friend. Jesus, I don't understand. If you ask me, that ain't no friend. That doesn't look like a friend. Doesn't sound like a friend. Doesn't act like a friend. He's not a friend. But Jesus doesn't lie. When Jesus says something, he means it. And he calls Judas friend. Somehow, and I'm not sure... What? But Jesus sees something good in Judas amidst his darkness. To the point of calling him friend. You see, we need to realize that every single person on the planet is created in the image of God. That means God's DNA and fingerprints are in everybody's life. Unfortunately, people live without him. And because of that, they do some evil things. And sometimes we're the recipients of that evil. But don't ever forget that somewhere buried in them, although you can't see it often, there's something good. And he calls him friend. You see, Jesus understood that this scheme that's come against him is much bigger than Judas. Judas is not smart, or smart enough to come up with this scheme. He's just a tool in the evil one's head. You see, Jesus realized that the scheme was much bigger than Judas. And that's why he says in Luke 22, 53, this is the time when darkness needs to rule. Let it be so, Judas. Do what you came here for. You see, sometimes those that have wounded us the most, we can become very quickly squinty eyed, anger and bitter, and we grind our teeth and tell ourselves, I wish they were dead. But then we need to remember the Apostle Paul who said, Our fight is not against people. But against the rulers and authorities and the powers of this world's darkness, against the spiritual powers of evil in the heavenly realm, this battle, this scheme, those garbage moments of our lives are much bigger than the individuals that are involved. There's an evil one who wants to destroy your life. And yet in those moments of garbage, Jesus says, will you keep your eyes wide open to the wonder of God? Will you keep trusting me and believing me? Because if you do that, 
your heart and soul will beam with light. But if you let those trashy moments of life, those betrayal moments, allow you to squint your eyes and become hate-filled and angry and embittered, you will be like a dank cellar. Jesus saw good and bad and he calls his betrayer a friend. Jesus also found purpose in the pain. You see, Matthew 26, 56 says, But this has all taken place, that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. He found purpose in the pain. He realized that the prophets had proclaimed that this would happen to the Son of God, and so he found purpose amidst the pain. This is how Jesus chose to view the storm that came his way. He realized that there was necessary turbulence in the plan of God. There are times in life when life gets turbulent. It's just the way it is. His suffering was necessary to fulfill the prophecies. And his sacrifice was necessary to fulfill the law. But it's interesting that in that dark moment in Jesus' life, he said this in Matthew 26, 53. Surely you know that I can ask my father and he would give me more than 12 armies of angels if I wanted. It's amazing that even amidst the darkest, darkest moment of Jesus' life, he could see his father with the angels. You see, friends, sometimes it's in our most trashy, garbage-filled moments of life where we actually meet with God in the most profound way. I find that the people that are so have so much depth and character, you sit down with them and you talk to them, and it's not because their life has had no problems, it's because they've had a tremendous amount of problems, but amidst their problems, they've met with God in a life-changing way. And so Jesus, in the dark moment, he sees the Father, and he sees the angels, and they're right there with him. It's not anything new in the scriptures. Over and over again, Men and women of the scriptures who are experiencing dark moments of their life, God would come and visit them in an intimate way. Let's take Jacob in Genesis. He's fleeing from his brother who's about to kill him and wants to murder him. And he's running and he's running and he's running. Finally, Jacob gets tired. He takes a rock, he puts it down. He lays his head and he falls asleep. And he's in a dark moment of his life. He doesn't even know if, if, if he's going to make it through the night. And it's in that dark moment where the Lord gives him a vision and there's a ladder. That ladder goes from the earth to the sky. And going up and down the ladder are angels ascending and descending. And at the top of the ladder there's God. And Jacob wakes up from this storm and he says, this is Bethel. This is the house of God. This is the very presence of God. And that dark moment in Jacob's life turned into the very house of God. You see, life tends to happen that way. Sometimes it's in the most darkest moments of your life. It's been my story. In some of the most darkest moments of my life, I have tasted and seen and met with the living God like I've never experienced. Jesus found purpose in the pain. Of all the treasure Jesus saw in the trash, this was the most significant. He saw his father. He saw his father's presence in the problem. Rick Warren, well-known author and pastor who just recently went through a horrible time in his life. You think Rick Warren, he's on top. I mean, he's, he's, he's written purpose-driven church and purpose-driven life. And, and his church is somewhere in the neighborhood of 30,000 members. And he's got it all. And just this year, his son took his life. That's pretty dark. Try being a pastor, having to get up and say, my son took his life. It was him who said, Rick Warren, your deepest life message will come out of your deepest pain. Your deepest life message will come out of your deepest pain. See, it's interesting that God never promises to remove us from our struggle. Don't let any preacher on TV tell you that if you're a follower of Christ, there should never be trash around. Below me. With life comes challenges and trials and tribulations and sometimes it feels overwhelming. 
It doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. It doesn't mean you're a bad Christian. It doesn't mean it's life. You see, God never promises to remove us from our struggle, but he does promise, however, to help change the way we look at our challenges. That's why the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 18 says this, So we're not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside it often looks like things are falling apart on us, on the inside, where God is making new life, not a day goes by without His unfolding grace. These hard times are small potatoes compared to the coming good times. The lavish celebration prepared for us. There's far more here that meets the eye. The things we see now are here today, but they're gone tomorrow. But the things we can see now will last forever. And so though you might have moments of trash and you feel like it reeks and you feel like you're never going to get through it. Because of God's presence who meets you right in the midst of your trash. You see with your head up, clear, eyes of wonder, believing in God. And all of a sudden God radiates his life through your cracked vessel. Imperfect as they are. Because of his grace. Two chapters later Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 6. He says, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, in hardships, in distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger. It goes, it keeps going, it goes it, it, through glory, dishonor, bad report, good report, sometimes Genuine yet regarded as imposter, sometimes known yet regarded as unknown, sometimes dying yet we live on, beaten yet we're not killed, we're sorrowful at times yet we're always rejoicing, sometimes we're poor but yet making many rich, having nothing yet possessing everything. Are you getting Paul? He's saying, he's being honest, he's saying life isn't neat and tidy, it gets messy. And he lists a whole Lists of trash bags that he had to experience in life. Troubles, problems, sufferings, hunger, nakedness, danger, violent death. Maybe our trash bags are a little different than Paul's. Maybe our trash bag is unemployment. And all of a sudden... It gets dumped on our lap. The job we thought was secure, gone in a moment. And now we're grappling how we're going to do this. Maybe it's unfulfilled dreams. Things that we've always dreamt about in our life. And all of a sudden, they're, just, they're not happening. It's not, this is not the life I envision. Maybe a broken marriage. When you stood at that altar with your spouse, you didn't envision this. And there you are trying to grapple with the pieces. What about death? All of a sudden, somebody who you dearly love, out of the blue, tragically, passes away. And you're left with the stain of death. And it's like a dump of trash just got put into your world. What about betrayal? Somebody that you thought you can trust has betrayed you. And you're left hurting because of it. Maybe it's infertility. If you're a young couple and you've always desired to have a family and for whatever reason, it's not happening. And you're left with this gap in your life. What about that medical negative report? The doctor says it doesn't look good. And next thing you know, it's like a garbage truck just backed up and dumped it on your lawn. Dumped it in the heart. And you're thinking, what do I do now? I don't know about you. But I've had those moments in my life. And you know what? I'll probably have more moments like that. But somehow this is what hope is. Hope is not the absence of the garbage bags. No. Because what does Paul teach us? In Romans 8, 28, he says this. And we know that in all things. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love who have been called according to his purpose. He doesn't say we know that in some things. Or in only the positive things. No, he says in all things God works for the good. 
of those who love him. And so that's why Jesus said, keep your eyes open in wonder. No matter what happens, trust me so that your life can be filled with light. Don't squint your eyes and become angry and hateful because you will soon become a dank seller. And then he goes on to say, verses later, in 35 and 37, listen to this. The worship team is going to come up, but don't be distracted. Listen very carefully to what Paul says. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? Shall a broken marriage, shall unemployment, shall a bad medical report, shall loneliness, infertility, shall all these things separate us from the love of Christ? No, he says. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Do you get that? He says, in all these things, we sometimes take the in all off. We delete it from the verses and say, maybe it should say apart from these things, then we can become more than conquerors. Or maybe if we put away, away from these things, we can be more than conquerors. Or maybe without these things, we can become more than conquerors. No, no. Paul says in all these things. The assumption is sometimes you're going to be sitting in trash. The solution is not to avoid trouble, but to change the way we see our trouble. People of hope stand amidst the trash with eyes wide open in wonder, and we wait and we taste the presence of God. But you know what? Sometimes the trash feels like it doesn't just come in one bag. It comes in heaps of bags. You ever experienced that? And sometimes it feels like we're getting covered in the bags. And we can't see. That's when the body of Christ comes in. And says and reminds us, you know, friend, there's purpose. You're not alone. Let me move that bag away. Listen to me. Listen to me, Brian. There's hope of eternity. My church to become my family. I still have meals brought to me. That's why you need to get plugged into a small group, friend. Because you matter to God. And sometimes the heat gets really large. And you need a group of people to stand with you and say, We can do this together. We can be more than conquerors in Christ Jesus amidst all the trash. You get to do that. You get to. Be cared for. But the other piece of the small group is this. You also get to help somebody else. I love what Brian says. I, I want to be able to do this for others. Now. You see, you haven't understood the gospel. If you, there is a part of you that desires to help people. Because it's because of the gospel. It's because Jesus took all of our trash. That we're able even to be here and sing to him today. So the least I can do. Is speak a word of encourage. Make a meal and send it to my friend. Spend time praying and open the scriptures together. Yeah, life is busy, but you know what? At the end of the day, we need each other. Don't leave without joining a small group. Why don't you stand with me today? You go to the, the end of this gathering, there's a small group table you can sign up. But more than that today, maybe you've come in. And you've come in with all kinds of bags in your hand. Listen, we're not the kind of church that says, leave your garbage at home. This is only for people who have it together. No, 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 no. You bring your trash in with you. You bring it in and together, we're going to go to the hope giver. And we're going to say, Lord, here we are in the trash. But we're going to open our eyes in wonder and believe and trust in you so that you can fill our lives with light. Lord, we will not squint our lives and our eyes and become like a dang summer. Jesus is your cornerstone, friend. If you've come and you haven't said yes to Jesus yet, you can do that. You can say, you know, I've been trying to grapple with the garbage fills of life on my own. I didn't need to stop. 
Jesus is here to help you shed light into your world amidst the darkness. Jesus is our cornerstone. And so, you've come with your story. As you sing this song, may he send a ray of hope into your world. So your eyes would be open wide to the wonder of God. Sing with us this morning.